Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome all. Deuteronomy, part 30. Deuteronomy 21, chapter 21. Take that one on today. Again, a fairly short chapter. We'll see how it goes. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much for helping me with this particular lesson and helping me to see how uh, you intended for this lesson to be uh, understood. And help me, Lord, to be able to uh, deliver it in a way that's honoring to you. And we love you and we thank you so much for all you do for us each and every day. Thank you and praise you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so the first part of this actually is on this picture. It's in this bottom corner. Got an interesting uh, process about what happens if a if a, an apparent murder has happened near your town. And so, so we're going to talk about uh, a slain person that's found near a town. And it's up to the elders to decide uh, uh, if they can uh, prove who uh, who killed them. And if they can't, they got a process that God is going to give them to uh, to deal with it. So actually, so this this chapter actually uh, ends the section on religious and national regulations, uh, which began with chapter eight. We find here interesting and remarkable laws regulating many different aspects of life of Israel. If anyone is found slain, let's uh, get the verses up here so you can read verse verse here. If anyone is found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who has slain him. So presumably death was by, uh, wasn't by natural causes, it has been ruled out, and it was evident that the deceased has been murdered, yet it was not known who killed him. So this was important based on a principle stated in Numbers 35, 33, and 34, how to do with blood spilt on the land. Let's read Numbers 35 for a second here. So you shall not pollute the land wherein you are, but blood is defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for the Lord, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. So this passage shows that the blood of an unsolved, an unavenged murder defiles and pollutes the land. Therefore, if there is a murder unavenged, some kind of cleansing is necessary, so the land will not be defiled. I was just thinking about it, the fact that it might kind of remind me going all the way back to Cain and Abel, when God actually said that I, I see your, your brother's blood crying to me out of the land. Uh, same yeah, basic idea. I didn't put that verse down, but uh, just made, I just thought of it. But continuing on, let's finish this section, verses 2 through 6. Then the elders and the judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. Oh, they're going to try to find the closest city to where the slain person was found. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take a heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in a yoke. So it's, it's never done any work before. And that's what you kind of see in that corner there. Now you've got the heifer lying uh, on the ground. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is ne neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the uh, heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests and the sons of Levi shall come near, for them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord, and by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tied. And all the elders of the city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. So as you see uh, them doing there, that man in that corner. So the siege of atoning for a murder polluted land. The elders of the city nearest to the slain man. First, the matter of jurisdiction has to be settled. Then elders were, were responsible to make the sacrifice to atone for and cleanse the uh, murder polluted land. A heifer which has not been worked, 
Then appropriate sacrifice had to be made. A heifer was sacrificed by the sons of Levi in the presence of the city elders, who washed their hands over the sacrificed animal. This washing of the hands done in presence of the sons of Levi, who by their word every controversy and every assault shall be settled, was a powerful proclamation by the elders. We have done all we could to settle this case, but cannot. We are clean from all guilt in the matter of the slain man. Of course, the ceremony of washing the hands over the sacrificed animal meant nothing if the elders had, in fact, not done what they could to avenge the murder. Apart from that, the washing of hands, just as much as empty gesture as Pilate's washing of his hands at the trial of Jesus. Very similar uh, case there in Matthew 27, 24. Sounds like Pilate might have been a Jew, uh, in, in at least, or knew about the customs. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And of course, that was prior to Jesus' the death on the, on the cross. Now, continuing in verses 7 through 9. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. So they don't, they don't know how the man died. Be merciful, O Lord, until, this is kind of like a prayer. Be merciful, O Lord, unto the people of Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood upon the people of Israel charge, and the blood shall be forgiven him. So shalt thou put away the guilt of the innocent blood from among you, when, you the, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. So the prayer said by the elders as they wash their hands, provide atonement, O Lord, again, as we read there in Numbers 35, 33 through 34, makes the principle clear that the unavenged murder defiled and polluted the land, and atonement must be made for the land itself. So you should put away the guilt of innocent blood when Israel followed God's instructions for atonement. He honored his word by taking away their guilt. But the removal of guilt was always based on the blood sacrifice on a substitute. Uh, in other words, the, the, now that the transfer of the guilt was put onto the heifer is basically what's going on there. So this is basically, is, is, is again, foreshadowing the period of time when Jesus is actually going to die on the cross for our sins and be an atonement for our sins. She just love how it, just everything, every, just about every page in the Bible has something as a foreshadow, as a uh, as a pattern of what Jesus is going to do for us, or did for us in our case. Because as a matter of fact, you know, Jesus was actually murdered outside a city. Uh, it was outside of Jerusalem that he was crucified. Yes, he was, but his death could save his murderers. I think the Roman centurion who who had charge of his crucifixion is one of the men who was saved. We've got a very interesting thing here, and it's mentioned in three of the Gospels. I think I'll mention all three. It's a kind of an important thing. The centurion realized who Jesus Christ was. Matthew 27, 54. Now, we haven't got to this point yet, but we will. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him watched Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this man was the Son of God. From Mark's standpoint, this is what was written, Mark 15, 39. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he, he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. And in Luke's version, in Luke 23, 47, now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this man was a righteous man. So we can see how the, uh, God here is foreshadowing everything about what uh, what Jesus is going to do for us. And everything the Israelites did, from the tabernacle, all the different sacrifices, everything. Okay, so that ends this portion. And we're going to move now. Let me change pictures. Yeah, this is the picture for the, the rest of the chapter. We're moving to chapter 10. In chapter uh, verse 10 through 14. This has to do with laws regarding the taking of a wife from conquered peoples. A very common thing, actually. So let's read through this. 
I apologize for my voice this morning. It's a little crackly. <laughs> when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. Paring is just cut her nails. As you can see in this bottom corner here, that uh, get an idea of what they're talking about here. Probably this is before and after. Anyway. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whether she will, but thou shalt not sell her for money. Now, did I read verse 13? No, no, I didn't. I shall bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off of her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go, whether she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. That was, she has changed from being a slave to now being a, a wife. A totally different situation. So so the part that says, and see us among the captives, a beautiful woman, and, and you desire her. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon for a man to take a wife from among the captives, especially if she was a beautiful woman. Yet obviously, this was open to great abuse. So God gave specific guidelines to govern this practice in Israel. I think by shaving her head and her nails, they try to make her unattractive uh, so that he would have a chance for 30 days to decide if he, if he really liked her. And he wasn't allowed to defile her during that 30 days either. In other words, have, have intercourse with her. Notice she shaved her head and trimmed her nails. First, the captive woman had to be purified and humbled. This denoted a complete break from her past and a willingness to start anew, humbly as a child. Then it mentioned that she shall put the raiment of her captivity off of her. So she's going to change clothes. Remain in her your house. Second, the captive woman had to show a change of allegiance. That this showed that the captive woman no longer regarded her former nation and her former former family. Now she was a citizen of Israel. I couldn't help but think about now. Ruth wasn't a captive, but the story of Ruth. She willingly went, and she wasn't forced to to leave uh, Moab, but she wanted to. And I love this part. Because it talks about the fact that she completely dedicated herself to being an Israelite. She wasn't going to be a Moabitess anymore. And we see that in Ruth 1, 14 through 18. So this is a good example of this. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Oprah, uh, if you remember, Naomi had two, two daughters-in-law. Both her husbands had died. And they were leaving Moab. And they were heading back to Bethlehem. And it was just the three women. And Ruth had told the girls, go back to your families and stay with them and look for another husband. If they, were, they were still young enough. They had no children yet. Now, the Obed, one of the, one of the girls, did go back to her family. And that's where we're picking up here. But Ruth did not want to. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Ophrah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleaved unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people. And under her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. That's Naomi basically telling Ruth, go ahead, you do the same thing. And this is Ruth responding. And Ruth said to her, entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. What a statement. She's leaving her false gods of uh, Moab and going to the one true God. It's a beautiful scene. Verse 17 of Ruth 1. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will be I, uh, where will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if he ought but death, part thee and me. So is she not going to leave Naomi's side until she's actually 
uh, until uh, death. She does end up getting married, though, and that's the beauty of the story. And we'll get to that in a second. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So she said, okay, come on. And became ultimately in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we see this in Ruth 4. She ends up meeting a man by the name of Boaz, and they end up getting married. There's, there's a lot of interesting controversy over that part of it. And Ruth is actually going to be a surrogate mother for Naomi. Naomi didn't have any other sons. And so to carry on the name, uh, her, her husband's dead uh, her dead husband's name, she needed an heir, and she didn't have an, a male heir. So Ruth was actually going to be a surrogate mother and have a baby. The first one was going to be a baby that was actually going to be Naomi's, as to carry on the name. That baby ends up being in the same line going to Jesus. And so we see this in Ruth 4, 15 through 17. He shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it on her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the woman, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So, Three generations from David, which we know David uh, genealogy leads all the way to Jesus Christ. Beautiful story. It's only a four chapter book and it's a great little read. Okay, continuing. And she's supposed to bewail her father and mother for a full month. So she's been taken captive. Most likely her. <laughs> her parents have been killed because most of the men were uh, in this kind of a situation were killed. So third, the captive woman had to mourn her past associations. This would be time when she would, could resolve issues in her heart regarding her family, and when her husband-to-be could live with her a month without intimate relations. So you can see if he really wanted to take this woman as a wife and to make sure he was not making a decision based only on physical appearance. That's what they did by cutting her hair or attractiveness. Give the man a chance too to make sure that uh, he truly was, uh, he truly enjoyed her uh, being her husband. It also says you not, should not sell her for money. So at this point, you've now decided to wife her. Uh, you cannot, now she's no longer a slave. Slaves can be sold uh, like property. That's what they mean by merchandise. You should not treat her brutally after the month of mourning. The potential husband was free to marry the captive woman. Yet he did not have to. But if he decided not to, he had to set her free with dignity. This was a remarkable protection of the rights of the captive woman. It kind of reminds me of Abraham and Hagar. God, in that case, ensured that she was uh, that, that this was followed. Uh, remember Hagar? Hagar had the first child there, uh, Ishmael, and then finally Sarah uh, had the the heir that was going to continue on the, the tribe of, uh, of uh, the Jewish nation. Isaac. And so uh, Ishmael, though, was promised by God that he would have, uh, he would also uh, have a uh, inheritance, which ends up being actually the Arab nation today. Uh, that's the, that's uh, basically what came out of uh, Ishmael. But we see this in Genesis 21, 11 through 19. So I think it's kind of interesting because uh, Hagar was a slave woman for Sarah. Uh, and uh, actually she was an Egyptian. And and when Sarah couldn't uh, conceive a child, she offered Hagar, her handmaid, to her husband to have a baby with. And he did. And they had Ishmael. So very similar situation in that time frame. They had multiple marriages. This was not very, this is not, uh, this is pretty common, actually. We see the same thing in other marriages. But this is, uh, but uh, God still made sure that uh Hagar was was given her due right as a wife of uh, Abraham. And we see that in Genesis 21, 11 through 19. Let me read through that. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. In other words, Sarah wanted her gone because there was now there was controversy between her naturally born son of Isaac 
and this other child of uh, Ishmael, which was, which was actually older. And God said unto Abraham, let it, be, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, because of the bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God did say that Isaac was going to carry on the seed. Verse 13, and also thy son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So he's going to still honor the, the, other, uh, the other boy. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the, and the child had sent her away and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, first, it looks like she's going to die in the wilderness along with her son. This is where God steps in. Verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. This child was a uh, fairly decent size. It was probably, uh, I don't know the actual age they think he was, but he was old enough to be uh, almost, maybe, maybe like a preteen, maybe about nine or ten years old. I'm guessing there. And she went and sat her down over against her a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. But she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. God keeps his promises. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lag drink. So they end up living. And they go off to like uh, Saudi Arabia, basically. Uh, and they and they set up uh, and make a life of themselves there. So a very similar situation, though, with Hagar and uh, Abraham. Continuing on here, the next section so, so the other thing is, is protection of inheritance rights. And this is in verses 15 through 17. If a man have two wives, one beloved and the other hated. Now, I want to stop for a second and just talk about that word hated. Uh, I'll take it now. I was going to wait until after I read. I'll read through this. Realize that hated doesn't mean what it sounds like it means to us. And they that have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, it's really a bad translation. Verse 16, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he, will, he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, but he is the beginning of his strength, the right of his firstborn is his. Okay, realize that within within the family, uh, that the firstborn son always gained uh, the the larger portion, what they call a double portion. So let's say that a man had uh, four kids. Well, he would take and, and add a, 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 he would basically divide his fortune by five, and the, and the firstborn son would get two portions. That was the right of the firstborn. And what and what and what God is saying here is that if you have a child. Uh, of a woman that you hate. <clears throat> Let's take that example right now. So hated in this in this example, we got an example over in Genesis twenty nine thirty one. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, her, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. That's another example where the word is using. Basically, it means one was loved more than the other, as in the case of Rachel and Leah. In scripture, language that which is loved less is said to be hated. That was by, by uh, theologian Young who made that determination. Same here is more of the comparison of who, who was loved most, not necessarily that uh, they were despised or, as we use the word hated, basically just making it that he loved one of the women more than the other. And we say the same example when it comes to loving Christ. It's not that we hate our family. And that we see here in Luke, and it's always confusing to people when they first read this. It's in Luke 14, 26. And this is Jesus speaking. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, 
gain his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Well, God's not saying here that you're supposed to hate your family. What he's saying here is that, uh, and again, it's not the greatest translation, is that you need to love me more than anything. And that's very true. Which also your family should be loving the Lord the same way. Uh, it even says in this paragraph, and your own life also. In other words, even, even compared to our own life, we're supposed to love the Lord more than we love ourselves or our family. So I hope that kind of explains it a little bit better. So back to what we were talking about. So for me, that's two wise. Obviously, there are going to be problems in a home like this, especially if there is one loved and the other one unloved. Yet God commanded that the inheritance rights of the firstborn shall be respected, even if he were the son of the unloved wife. We saw that a perfect example in Leah and Rachel. A double portion of all that he has. This was the right of a firstborn in ancient Israel. The firstborn son was to receive twice as much inheritance as any other son. For example, if there were three sons, and I already gave an example. Jacob is a definite example of this. We were just talking about Leah. Even though some of them were favored over others, like Joseph. Joseph was the firstborn of his favorite wife, Rachel. Still, their inheritance was to be divided evenly. And except in this particular case, though, because the firstborn was Reuben. And he, he committed a sin worthy of losing his inheritance. He didn't lose his inheritance, but he lost a double portion. But he was still considered to be firstborn. At least the Bible doesn't tell us that, uh, that he gained his full inheritance. And that's in Genesis 49, 28. And these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is, the, is it, and this is it that thy father has spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. So comparing Genesis 46, 8, let's look at this verse. And these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. So he identifies Reuben as being his firstborn. When compared as the 12 tribes of Israel, it was... It was even, but Reuben was stated as firstborn, but due to the curse of lying with one of Jacob's wives, he doesn't seem to get a double portion. We see here when, he, when, he, when Jacob is passing out the, uh, yeah, the inheritance. It's also a prophecy. It's kind of an interesting chapter. Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4. It does not say he gets a double portion. This is Jacob actually speaking to his 12 sons. He does it each son one at a time. And so I'm just going to read verses 3 and 4 about Reuben. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. So he doesn't recognize him as firstborn. But he goes on to say, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up into thy father's bed, thou defilest thou it, and he went up to my couch. One of his concubines, uh, not not his mother, but uh, one of the other women that became Abraham's wife, he slept with. I have an interesting story of some of the sons of uh, that ended up becoming the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, so on to the, the next section, which is verses eighteen through twenty-one. Now we get into what they call a rebellious son. So you can see, you kind of see here, this is an example of, uh, of some of the things that uh, we were just talking about. This is probably most likely the, uh, the marriage, two marriages of two women and two different children. Now we're going to get into uh, this area of the rebellious son. And this is, the, and this is probably what we're talking about here. We got the marriage already here. This picture actually goes into chapter 22, too. So we'll see what that talks about tomorrow. Some of this other stuff. And we're going to end with this hanging on the tree. This is a very interesting one. Okay, continuing. Verse 18 and 19, 18 through 21. The penalty for a rebellious son. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto him, unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out 
unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. All this kind of stuff was always done at the gate of the city, as you can see in that picture. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear in fear. Stubborn and rebellious son. This does not mean a small child of any God, or even a young teen. But a son past the age of accountability who set himself in determined rebellion against his father and mother. You remember the, uh, the, the commandment by God, honor thy father and thy mother. So this was a very strong uh, penalty if, if the son did not honor their father and mother in this time frame. Who, when they had chastened him, would not heed them. The parents must have done a good job raising their son, calling him to obedience and chastening him as appropriate before the Lord. So this is so... If they, if they tried all avenues, then they were supposed to bring him to the elders of the city. Such a stunned and rebellious son was to be put on trial before the elders of the city. If they determined him to be chronically rebellious, then the son was to be stoned to death. I want you to realize that this is more of a threat than anything. It's like a deterrent uh, for all children to obey their parents. Because actually, uh, if you look through the history, they can't really find any, any time that this was ever done. Uh, for real. But it's important to note that the parents could not by themselves execute this penalty either. They had to bring the son on trial before impartial judges. This is in contrast to the ancient Greek and Roman, actually, law, which gave fathers the absolute right of life and death over their children. This was a control of parental authority more than it was, its, was an exercise of it. So the parents had to take the boy to the elders of the community, not only because of the decision of life or death should be taken out of their direct hands. So the mother and father could not decide that, uh, that to stone him. It had to be done by, uh, by trial. But because the guilt of the stubborn and rebellious son was not only against his parents, but against the whole community, he sowed the seeds of uh, cultural suicide in Israel. So basically, all Israel will hear in fear uh, that this law was clearly intended to protect the social order of ancient Israel. No society can endure when the young are allowed to make war against the old. Perhaps just the presence of this law is deterrent enough. We never have a scriptural example of a son being stoned to death because he was a stubborn and rebellious son. Yet the Jews say this law was never put into practice, and therefore it might be made for terror and prevention and to render the authority of his parents more sacred and powerful. That was by a theologian named Poole that uh, made that comment. Poole goes on to say, Stoning was the punishment appointed for blasphemers and idolaters, which if it seems severe was to be considered that parents are in God's stead and entrusted in good measure with his authority over their children, and that families are the matter and foundation of the church and commonwealth, and they who are not Naughty members and rebellious children in them do commonly prove the bane and plague of these, and therefore no wonder if they are nipped in the bud. And it's end of the quote by Poole. Made by a theologian by the name of Clark also adds, if such a law were enforced now and duly uh, executed, how many deaths of disobedient and proliferated children would there be at all corners of the land? That's That's for sure. We've got a similar system now, though, that, that most likely if this person were to break a law, he would go, and if the law was strong enough, he could actually face the death penalty, uh, even now. So now to the last section of our study here today, verses 22 and 23. I'm going to finish up because it, uh, this isn't a very long section. So called the curse upon one who hangs on a tree. This this has a uh, this 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 actually extends all the way into Jesus as uh, as being cursed for our sakes. Let's read it, verse twenty two and twenty three. And if a man hath committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou and, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain at night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. But he that is 
Cain is accursed of God, that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And hang him on a tree. And think of ancient Israel. This was something worse than being put to death. Worse than it was to, to be put to death and have your corpse less exposed to shame, humiliation, and scavenging animals and birds. Hanging on a tree does not have the idea of being executed by strangulation, <clears throat> but of having the corpse mounted on a tree of other prominent place to expose the executed one to disgrace and elements. Remember, the, the way that people were killed in this time frame uh, was by stoning. Crucifixion had not been invented yet, <clears throat> so this wasn't crucifixion. But basically, they would just hang him on a tree as, a, as evidence of this person. Probably similar to like in the uh, colonial period when they would put people in stockades and people would uh, harass them and make fun of them, throw tomatoes at them. Now, they didn't die, <clears throat> but they were put in uh, humiliation. But his body was not to remain there on the tree overnight. But surely, uh, but they had to be buried that day. Therefore, if anyone was executed and deemed worthy of such disgrace, of hanging on a tree. The humiliation to his memory and his family must not be excessive. It was a way of tempering even the most severe judgment with mercy. <clears throat> Clark, uh, <clears throat> Clark again adds on this one. It is worthy of a remark that in the infliction of punishment prescribed by the Mosaic law, we ever find that mercy walks hand in hand with judgment. What we call righteous judgment, which only God can really perform. But he who is hanged is accursed of God. The punishment of being hanged on a tree and left to open exposure was thought to be so severe that it was reserved only for those for which it was to be declared. This one is accursed of God. Paul expands upon this verse here in verse 23 with something from Galatians. We'll kind of end with this. In Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has to redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And now, now, this, now this verse makes a lot more sense to me. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus not only died in our place, but he also took the place as the accursed of God. Being hung on a tree in open shame and degradation, he received this curse which we deserved. And he did not, so that uh, we could receive the blessing of Abraham which he deserved and we did not. We are redeemed from the curse of the law by the work of Jesus on the cross for us. We no longer have to fear that God wants to curse us. He wants to bless us, not because of who we are or what we have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. What a great way to end that, uh, that section. And so let's uh, pray. And, and, and Lord, I praise you and I thank you so much, Lord, for doing that for us, for putting yourself on that tree for dying for our sins, for our, for our sinful and, uh, and uh, ravished bodies that didn't deserve what you gave us. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much uh, for, that, for that opportunity to be able to be in your kingdom and to be in uh, into, uh, oh, Lord, thank you so much. And I give you praise and thanks in all you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Oh. I don't know, sometimes, sometimes we don't realize what the Lord did for us. Uh, and this lesson today really kind of spoke to that. So I hope it did to you also. You know, if someone here has not uh, received the blessings in the, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a great time to, to reach out to the Lord and realize that you are a sinner and reach out to the Lord and realize that you need salvation and that you need, uh, you need what he can offer you. And, and, uh, all you need to do is pray, dear Heavenly Father, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a sinner, a sinner in need of salvation. Lord, please come in and, and help me to be a better person and, and, and to uh, and, uh, help me through, through life. And I give myself to you 
And uh, if you do this in Jesus' name and reach out to him, and he will respond. And uh, I hope you do that today if you haven't done it already. And so see you again tomorrow, and we'll continue in Deuteronomy 22. And hope you have a great day.